Welcome to the Challenging the Way We Age podcast, hosted by the Mavericks of Senior Living, Francis and Catherine, focusing on creativity, ingenuity, and inspiration to educate and inspire changes in the senior experience, breaking the status quo. We want to thank our supporters, Assured Assisted Living, Serenity App, Sevens Home Care, and Sevens Residential Memory Care. Now get ready for the next episode. Good afternoon, you Mavericks. It's Francis, your Chief Curiosity Maverick, and we are here at Kala. Yeah, and this is Catherine, your Chief Inspiration Maverick. And we are fortunate to have a very insightful, forward-thinking guest with us, Miss Sarah Haggerty, who is the ombudsman for Dr. Cog, which is not an actual doctor. It's the Denver <laughs> Regional Council of Governments. Is yes, right? you got All that right. correct, wow. Francis. Good for right. you, because I didn't know that. So, Sarah, thank you for joining us. <laughs> You're welcome. I'm happy to be here. And I do want to clarify that I am not the long-term care ombudsman. I am an a long-term <laughs> care ombudsman. Um, yeah. Speaking of that real quick, how many of there? How many ombudsmen are there? I believe right now we have 14 ombudsmen on staff okay. between the long-term care ombudsman program and the PACE ombudsman program. Um, Long-term care ombudsmen specifically visit assisted living homes and nursing homes. And the PACE ombudsman visit the PACE centers, which is the program for all-inclusive care for the elderly. Uh, And those would be the Innovage centers throughout the metro area. And first and foremost, we advocate for residents in long-term care. Right. Sarah, how did you get into it? How did you get into being um, in with Dr. Cog, being an ombudsman? How did, how did you get to where you are right now? Well, in college, I studied gerontology or okay. aging studies okay. and worked in a continuing care community. Mm-hmm. I was a recreation assistant and a dietary aide. Wow. And that, um, that introduction to the world of gerontology really... It put my career on that path, mm-hmm. and and when I got my first full-time job after college, it was as a program uh, coordinator for Sage of the Rockies, okay. which is the services and advocacy for GLBT elders. Wow. Um, and I ran recreational and social programs, mm-hmm. as well as providing information and assistance for lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender older adults for two years at wow. the Center on Colfax. I did not even know that exists. Neither did I until yeah. like right now. And I've been yeah. in this industry for 10 years. Yeah. So. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about that fantastic organization a little bit later on okay. during, okay. during this podcast. Yeah, uh, we'd podcast. like to hear that. I think our, our mm-hmm. listeners would really like to hear Absolutely. that. Absolutely. Absolutely. And um, from there, I served on the Aging and Disability Resource Council uh, Advisory Council for Dr. Cog, okay. and that's sort of how I got introduced to the organization. And at that point in time, I knew that eventually I really wanted to work for the area agency that's on awesome. aging. Well, we need youthful, young, creative yes. injection, and we need more young people to go into the aging services or aging studies, correct? Mm-hmm. Is that, yeah. Mm-hmm. And don't forget, it's not just providing direct care. It's doing things mm-hmm. like Sarah's doing the advocacy, the ombudsman, there's a lot of opportunities in that aging service because we don't have enough people. We need more. So give, let's dive right into it. What are, what are the diversity challenges that you see for the LBGTQ community? I think they're enormous. I think the one of the biggest challenges and hurdles for providers is first, recognizing that they are serving the LGBTQ population at all. Um, Many providers don't recognize that they're serving these individuals, and statistically, it is the case, regardless of whether you know it or not, or whether that person in your community is out, and how we approach the issues of uh, cultural competence working with LGBT people will impact the quality of care that we're able to provide for everyone, because it's an invisible um, minority. So well said. You don't know that you're serving people. You may not know, you may not ever know, but how you approach it and your attitude will really show whether or not um, these people can be comfortable being who they are Mm. within the community. And then the other, the second biggest challenge I can identify is many people will say, especially in the healthcare industry, well, we treat everybody the same. Mm. Well, I think that equity isn't about treating everybody the same. It's not even about treating others how you would like to be treated. It's about treating others how they would like to be treated and asking the right questions. That's really a powerful Mm. statement. It's good. 
finding a provider is just one of the hurdles. Right. Uh, the other hurdles are getting acceptance from the people who are providing care for you. I didn't who, even think oh, yeah. The people that you're living with. Um, and really, the issue of being treated with dignity and respect and acknowledged for being who you are and your whole person, um, not just what people recognize right. on the surface. Do we... Do we have we already have a lot of social isolationism for seniors in general? Do we have an even further risk of that? Yes, LGBTQ, especially older adults, uh, are far more likely to be isolated. Okay. Eighty percent actually live alone. Wow. Um, well into their older adult years, and uh, they are four times less likely to have children. Ninety okay. percent of LGBT people over the age of sixty do not have children which means that the traditional familial support structures that we think about being able to support us as we age don't exist for for a vast majority of LGBT older people. What do you think we can do then, maybe not maybe different, not better, t- to engage that, to try to break down that desire to, to, to self-isolate or social isolate? What, what do you think we can do? I think it's important to ask people what makes them happy. And how they find joy okay. and create uh, an environment where people are supported regardless of sexual orientation, gender identity, race, religion. Mm-hmm. Um, and ask open-ended questions of the people that we're providing services or care for. Right. Uh, make no assumptions. That's good, yeah. When we make assumptions, we automatically knock down a lot of possibilities. Um, So it's really important when somebody's coming into care or needs a service to ask them, are there important people in your life that we can call if you need help? Rather than saying, do you have a husband or you have a wife? Um, Uh, Because when you ask them something like that, I mean, regardless of whether it's a gay or lesbian individual, that could uh, trigger a negative memory of the loss of a spouse. Right. it could also remind a lesbian or gay individual that they weren't uh, previously allowed to marry and yeah. have that sort of long-term relationship. But that doesn't mean that they don't have long-term relationships. Right. And so if you ask them, is there somebody important? Do you have a partner? Is there somebody I can contact if you need help or if I need to let them know about a, a change in your condition? So really remembering that our language is so important. Mm-hmm and the way that we phrase things, make them as open as possible and not specific to, to certain ways of living that we may be familiar with. It, it's almost like we need to not make assumptions about how we want to age and to have a genuine open question about how they, all of our seniors, all of our residents want to age. Is that what you mean by that open-ended question? Exactly. Asking, creating a person-centered care plan, Mm -hmm. something that the resident is able to direct themselves, and so that they can fill in the blanks for you. Because, you know, in the clinical model, or or most long-term care models, it's about filling out the forms, Mm -hmm. and then uh, following the care plan that's on the form. Right. (laughs) But if we're not involving the resident or the patient in that plan, Mm -hmm. it really it just doesn't work and the person's not going to get what they need to thrive. Also well said. So with with the idea of the care plans, are we doing enough to meet the care needs of our LGBTQ population? I I would have to say no. I I, I don't, I'm not sure we're doing enough to meet the care needs of any population. uh, And that's Um, that's fair. In in my experience as a resident advocate, I, I think most providers are falling short of the mark of really being truly person-centered um, and everybody has room for improvement of course um, and if we ask the residents or the people that know the resident best how can we provide the best care for this person how can we make them happy what can we do to provide um, services that can best meet this person's needs. It's really, right. That's where it should be coming from, not about our ideas of what's best for the person. Yeah. So would it be almost, we need to change like our assessment, our ideas of what an assessment is, our ideas of what a care plan? 
all of us want to be known. It, yeah. It's it's something that we seek connection. Human right. beings want to be connected to other people. And if I think in a lot of instances, if a person starts, especially with dementia, they start exhibiting a behavior. Mm -hmm. It's viewed as something negative that we need to treat and prevent. Of course, yeah. Rather than trying to get to the root of why is this happening? Yeah. What is what are we not doing for this person? Curiosity. Yeah. I think should be at the heart of what we do. I love it. And getting to know people. Yeah. Um, if you're going to be in the industry of caring for people, you should really want to know what makes them tick rather than um, just thinking about how are you going to manage <laughs> their needs. That's awesome. That That's powerful. That That's just, and I'm just sitting here thinking that it, that's the quote. That's what we're going to pull out for this podcast because that... That's the center, the heart of all of this, and it's the most important thing for us to keep in mind. What you're doing, you know, the, the advocacy for both the residents and the community is really important, but I want to make it more inclusive. So are there any communities that you're aware of or thought leaders that are doing things a little differently, especially for the LGBTQ? I'm not aware of any specific long-term care providers yeah. that stand out um, as being excellent uh care providers for the LGBTQ population. Mm -hmm. I will say that Denver Health has the LGBT Center for Excellence for uh, health care providers that okay. are culturally competent in working with the LGBT population. Um, and additionally, the Center on Colfax, formerly the GLBT Community Center of Colorado, has excellent programming for LGBT okay. youth and older adults, and they have, they're a wealth of knowledge and resources for people looking to understand mm -hmm. those things better. The project visibility training that I just did today was originally created by the Boulder County Area Agency on Aging, okay. and now uh, provides education to people who want to be trainers like myself okay. or communities uh, through in the Boulder County area. I'm trained as a trainer for the Denver metro area. Okay. So if anybody wants to hire, not hire, but uh, <laughs> request speaking gotcha. services from from myself, uh, you would they would certainly be willing, able to reach out to me. And I just also want to plug for my current employer. Oh, yeah, please. Um, yeah. The long-term care ombudsman and uh, PACE Ombudsman Program mm -hmm. at the Area Agency on Aging at Denver Regional Council of Governments has several uh, staff members who are trained as project visibility trainers. So you can contact our front desk and uh, request speaking services. Can you elaborate a little bit on what project visibility is, please? Yeah, project visibility is a one to three hour training for providers as well as community organizations that uh, strives to create empathy and support for LGBT older adults. Okay. Um, and it does so through pre presenting a variety of information about um, how to support LGBT older people, as well as historical context, and so on and so forth. Okay, so there's a lot of, of information that can be shared. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One question, if nothing changes, what do you see happening in this industry? Like, where do you see, what, what is our trajectory if we don't start doing some things that will create hope and, and make some shifts? I don't think things aren't going to change because like okay. the uh, the baby boomers, if you know anything mm. about them, <laughs> they they don't settle. No, <laughs> they are groundbreakers. And they will they, they will mm. create the change that they want to see as they age into right. needing care. Um, I think that assisted living and nursing home care will change. I don't yet know what that change is going to be, but I would imagine that the baby boomers are going to drive it. To speak a little bit to the keynote this morning, yeah. uh, was it Britannia? Br yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, the speaker who is talking about millennials in the workforce. Right. I think that will also be a huge force of, of change in the long-term care industry um, as that millennial workforce really takes hold of management positions. We're going to see a lot of change in how long-term care is operated. And I would agree. I agree too, but I don't see a lot in the aging services yet, and I want that to change. Though I mean, I I, we need coming. it. You think they're I think coming? They're okay. coming. They're coming. Good. And, that, and we need them, though, is what I'm saying. Yeah, we um, need them. A lot of my cohort uh, at Ithaca College, mm -hmm. the 
excellent gerontology program. Okay. Really teaches. Is that New York? It's in New York. Oh, cool. Oh, okay. Oh, cool. Um, and I know that it's a really exciting program. Great professors, and there there is excitement being generated awesome. in the younger pop in awesome. the younger generations yeah. regarding long term care. Um, and I think that the need need is often what drives uh, people to go into a workforce. True. And, um, I know that's part of the reason I went into uh, gerontology was because I knew it was going to be very relevant mm -hmm. during my lifetime. What I you know always we want to ask about is what do you want to challenge? Like if, if you're in the driver's seat, what do you want us to challenge as a you know society as a community? I really want to challenge the one size fits all <sighs> model to uh. institutional care for the aging population that melts my heart um, the the area it. agency on aging is currently trying to figure out innovative ways to provide services to a population that is ever growing ever changing and their needs are just going to keep increasing over time and right. currently we can't afford to put everybody into an assisted living home no. or a nursing home mm -hmm. we can't afford that and we no. we don't really want that right. that's once once you're there a lot of things have gone wrong to be honest um, huh. we should try to keep people in the community mm -hmm. as long as possible and maybe some ideas about more communal living um, provide Providing ride-sharing services to older adults who need to get places and can't drive anymore. Um, providing in-home support. Providing companionship support. Because I think one of the biggest reasons why people start to fail to thrive is because of that isolation. Yes, because of not having that human connection that's so necessary yeah. for all of us to really do our best and succeed and live at home. It's just refreshing. To, like... I've, I haven't heard anybody say I want to challenge the one size fits all. That just is so cool. Like, I mean, that, that is and awesome. And you're singing our music when you say things like that. And I want to say, I think you're a real gem. And yeah. I really think that you're already changing the world by yeah. just doing what you're doing, saying the things you're saying. And I know that you will, but keep being a stand for what you're what you're doing and i can't you are just the beacon of hope in my eyes yeah. of what we can achieve and i mean that because we need more people like you that are yeah. sharing your ideas yeah. your thoughts your your desire to just help but help is whatever help may be thank you so much you're you're both very very kind to say all of those things and i just want to say that the best way that we can help others is to empower them to live their best lives yep. yeah empower i yep. think we have to create purpose driven lives yep and they have to have a purpose behind them so yep. Agreed. Um, what would be anything that you'd want our listeners to kind of hear as a final wrap-up or a final summary I think that uh, what I would really like to drive home right now is that all of us are unique and we're all different and um, the more that we come to recognize our, how our differences make mm -hmm. us stronger, the better off everybody is going to be. And with that being said, how can they find more about either Dr. Cog, the Ombudsman, you? So uh, the, the best way to find information about Dr. Cog is by visiting www.drcog.org. Okay. Um, and you can find information about all of our different divisions, uh, including the Area Agency on Aging. Okay. We also have our fingers in a couple of other pies uh, that I'm sure you would be very fascinated in as well. <laughs> okay. um, That's great. That's yeah. awesome. We'll Absolutely. have to chat in more detail. Yeah. I like it. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much. much, Sarah. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks for listening. The Mavericks want to hear from you. Visit us on Facebook and Instagram at Mavericks of Senior Living or MavericksofSeniorLiving.com and leave us your comments, questions, and ideas for future podcasts.